welcome to the Dad Ventures podcast, sponsored by Connex, encouraging kids of all ages to think outside the blocks. Now, more and more dads want to be involved in their children's development, but sometimes it can be hard to find guidance and support. As a hands-on dad myself, I want to help create an aspirational image of fatherhood that we can all strive for through our variety of guests and their journey through parenthood. So let's talk, let's laugh, and let's share the things we find difficult and become the type of dads we really want to be. Today, I'm joined by a dad who has an array of talents. Uh, Not only did he spend 20 years on the popular ITV soap Emmerdale, but he's also been showcasing his skills as a motor racing driver since 2012. He recently also found time to become the 2019 Strictly Come Dancing champion. It is, of course, Kelvin Fletcher. Yes, Nigel. Thank you for that kind introduction, mate. First, let me get it right. You've got uh, Marnie, who's four, and then Milo, who's nearly two. Is that right? Yes, yes, that's it, yeah. Are they a rambunctious um, pair? Do they <laughs> do they get on? I mean, first, how good is it being a... You know what I mean? I, I just love being a dad it is it is is my proudest achievement and my greatest achievement nothing like it is there and and anyone everyone tells you oh you'll know when you're a parent you'll know when you're a dad or and you kind of like brush it off and you're a little bit like yeah "Yeah, what do you know that i don't know and you're like (laughs) oh if i'd have known that (laughs) exactly let's get straight to it okay because we know that strictly is an undertaking it's a lot to do the the schedule the the training all of that can you give me a little bit of a rundown of what your daily routine was like once you were partnering up with OT? I think it's probably the, the most intense thing I've done. I surpassed all my own expectations. I think I got fitter than I've ever been, and not just physically, but mentally. It's the most intense challenge I've ever undertook. I think I read somewhere that you did some some nine till like seven, eight in the evenings. Yeah, a, a normal day. I think nine, nine we did, or a 10, 10. Um, but you know, quite often I'd be getting home, um, miss the kids' bath time, bedtime, which obviously, as you know, is a crucial part of the day. So, quite quickly, I understood the undertaking and the sacrifices that that one has to make. How did it affect the relationship with your kids and your partner? It, it was tough in many ways. Um, tough at times where I didn't realise three or four weeks was the longest I did without seeing them. Wow! And I've never done that before. That was hard to take. And I, I just did notice a slight change in, in my daughter, hugging me out a little bit tighter. And I'd be thinking, well, she was, she was missing her daddy, you know? And uh, it's, as you know, you know, anyone who works away, whether you're an actor, dancer, presenter, it pulls on your heartstrings when your little ones acknowledge that you've been away and yeah. says, you know, daddy, are you going to go to work again? And I mean, even lately, she's been asking questions. What, why, do, why do you go to work, daddy? What, what do you work for? And I've tried to explain that, you know, we. I work to get pennies and and, um, and and I enjoy work as well. And work is something that, one, it gives you some pennies to buy things and, and then I obviously list whatever's in the house, whether it's the, a teddy or a, the biscuit we're eating or whatever it is that penny, pennies buy things. Um, so daddy likes me to pretend to be other people and that's my job, that's how I explain it to her. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you brought up two really, really interesting points there. First one, um, which I can relate to a little bit, um, I went to, I think it was Singapore for about two to three weeks for work um, when my daughter was weeks old, weeks old. And my son was a, nearly two and he was as well, just wanting to hold on a bit tight. When are you coming back, daddy? And even to this day, if I'm going away for even a day, two days, the first question he'll ask me is, when are you coming back? Literally, when you, and it may, and wow. Part of me sometimes feels like, have I been away too much? Is this affecting you in a way that I don't even know yet that will show later in life? And it it makes you think, doesn't it? It does certainly make you think without question. Um, Somebody asked recently, you know, is is there a guilt with that? And, um, you know, wrongly or rightly, I can only be honest, and I, I don't feel a guilt of that in a sense of, I know I'm doing what's right for my family, you know? Yes, I would prefer to be at times with my kids, not all the time because it is good to get away. Let's not forget that. <laughs> Let's be fair now. Dare, From time to time, you need a bit of time for yourself. <laughs> but you know, because I was having a chat with a mate of mine recently, and he's, he's away a lot with work, and uh, he was saying, I feel really guilty, Kelvin, being away sometimes. And I'm like, don't, man, you know, because I could see it, it was a bit of a burden on him. I said, mate, don't, do, don't, don't feel guilty. You, you are doing, you know, you're working hard, mate, and you're doing the right thing. And, and I guess me reassuring him was also psychologically maybe reassuring myself. One of your big interests is 
uh, Speedway, right, that your dad got you into. Tell me a bit about that. My dad used to tell me I used to go to bed when I was three or four years old with a spanner. So, you know, most kids... <laughs> go to bed with a little teddies or comfort blankets or whatever it is. I used to go with a, with a little spanner. That was my thing. So from being an early age, I was a car enthusiast, you know, motorbikes, cars, anything really, anything with an engine. That was that was my fixation. And then, yeah, 2012, I, uh, I was at a car show with my dad, saw an advert for an old classic car, and uh, we said, let's give it a go. My dad had actually bought me a Mini when I was about 13 years old, a classic Mini. I used to like literally take the carburetor off, put it back on, take the wheel, just fix the mess and, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, learn about the engine with him. And um, and we were reminiscing looking at this old Mini and we decided to give it a go. So I did my racing license and I went, I went, I went racing, you know, that was 2012. And in a, in a strange way, it's kind of, it's now another career, you know, I started out as a hobby. Yeah. Uh, I treated it as a hobby. It was a hobby. And then quite quickly, I started to take it a little bit more seriously and um, I treated it as as a job. I, you know, I, I absolutely gave myself time. I was very serious about my expectations, and uh, now it's become, like I say, another career. So that was the. I think that was the turning point. When you treat something as a hobby, it's in most cases always going to remain a hobby. Yeah. And uh, I started uh, with a different frame of mind, and now, like I say, I've you know I've made a successful go at it, and I plan to go beyond that as well. When you became a father, did the fact that it's a dangerous sport become more of a concern to you and the family? Outside looking in, yeah, it's, it's dangerous. With all, I guess, due respect for people that don't know anything about the sport, about motorsport. Mm. You look at F1, it only takes you two minutes to go onto YouTube and see these spectacular crashes. Yeah. And, it, you know, like I say, outside looking in, it looks very dangerous. But, um, you know, safety is absolutely paramount. The amount of safety equipment we've got as drivers, the cars are prepared. They're not just like normal road-going cars. These are built to sustain and designed to withstand contact yeah. so in a weird way i felt safer and i do feel safer racing a, a gt3 bentley around silverstone at 160 miles an hour than i do driving what used to be my daily commute to, to leeds from manchester on the m62 yeah because you know on a racetrack there are no lamp posts there are no curbs there are no other um, pedestrians and, and cars coming the opposite way and we've not got that we've got skilled drivers at the top of their game racing in one direction uh, with, a, with a common goal, yes, to win and take the car to its limit, but we're not seeking an adrenaline rush, we're not seeking a thrill. Accidents do happen, but, um, you know, touch wood, I've been absolutely fine so far. To be fair, you talking about racing a, a GT Bentley at 160 round a track does sound like a lot of fun. <laughs> you know, it's fun, don't get me wrong, you know, I'm not, I'm not there like that, you know. Um, and, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm smiling from, from ear to ear thinking, this is just insane. How am I getting to do this, you know? Um, and you just enjoy it while you can because, you know, as we all experience, there's, there's highs and lows, you know. One, one minute you're the... Um, the talk of the town uh, and, and the next you know you, you're not and then that's my career you know that's um, yeah um, especially with my career as an actor I know exactly where you're coming from you never know you know you can be flavour of the month one one month and nobody cares the and that's why family I think is really important because my family are my absolute consistent and is going to be there through thick and thin you know my kids my wife my um, yeah brothers you know my, my immediate family you talk about loving racing uh loving your family loving your job and work what aspirations have you got for your children i guess my biggest aspirations for my kids is um for them to experience as much as life has to offer you know ups and downs yes i want to try and protect them and um and, and experience as few of those uh, lows as, as possible but in a weird way, that's what, you know, uh, in my experience, maybe that's what made those better moments that bit sweeter, you know, because I've experienced things that weren't so great and then, you you know, vice versa. So I think travel's a, a, a massive, a massive thing and, and and I'm hoping that my children will have a love for travel as, as, as I have and my wife have because that's brought um, a fullness of, of life and a, and a learning of life that I don't think anything else ever could or ever will. Uh, different areas, different class, different, you know, everything. Um, I think travel and, and awareness is absolutely key. And and that confidence, set, that gives you that sense of confidence where um, I already kind of see now with my little daughter, it feels like she's been here before. She seems so worldly wise and, and, and uh, <laughs> her enthusiasm to converse with anybody, young or old. Yeah. She just sees this untouched, like, oh my goodness, that, that inquisitive nature 
which is so vast within children. The thing is, you, the way you describe it and the way you talk about it, it sounds like she's got a confidence that that some children um, only discover maybe a little bit later on. She's not afraid to go and ask someone a question, which is a lovely thing to have. Yeah, I think encouragement is key. Um, if I'd have said to my mum, uh, if I rang her up tomorrow and said, mum, I'm, I'm going to stop acting, uh, I'm going to stop racing, I'm thinking of getting into into medicine. I really want to become a doctor. I'm going to try and... Or I want to be a prime minister. Whatever like, weird and wonderful career, I'd, yeah. she'd be like, yeah, absolutely, yeah. we Go for it, Kelvin. You know, she's so supportive. And, That's amazing. And that always kind of, as a kid, gave me that sense of belief that anything is possible. I think instilling that in our children is one of the biggest things. And I, I'm the same, I try and instill it in mine, that you can go or do whatever you can. And even now, to this day, my dad, my parents will be like, oh, what's Rory going to get into? Is he going to go and study to be a lawyer? Is he going to go and study to be a doctor? Because they, they are from that old school way of thinking where you have to study to be whatever and do the yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, if he wants to, that, yeah, that's cool. He'll, he'll do that. But I've got no qualms about him wanting to become a chef. Or, yeah, yeah. And, and my dad might be a little bit more reserved about that and go, oh, come on, blah, blah, blah. You want more for him. You want more for him. And I'm like, no, it, whatever he chooses, he can take to a level that maybe hasn't been seen before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's that instilling that confidence to be able to do whatever you want and take it as far as you want to take it. Yeah, the most successful person is the person who is able to live their life how they want to live it. Yeah. I deem success as as those, you know, that ability to live live as you want. And there's certain parameters you have to abide by. Financially yeah. is one of the biggest. That in itself brings certain decisions or choices. Um, but, you know, that, that, that sense of freedom and um, that enthusiasm for life, I think, is, is absolutely key. So, yeah, my children, I'd be the same. If they, whatever career path they, they choose, um, then I'd be supportive. If they're 25, 30 years old and they still don't know what career they want to indulge in, then that's fine as well, you know, there'd be no pressure. It's just taking what this amazing world has to offer and uh, people to meet as well, you know. Um, everyone's, as my dad always tells me, everyone's got a story. Yeah. And some of the most interesting people I've ever met, inspiring people, people I've learned most from, uh, have been the most unassuming. And I guess in many ways, unfortunately, what society would deem as, as maybe failures or insignificant, you know, they've they've been the absolute opposite. So it's important to have that that understanding and that um, that empathy yeah. and open-mindedness that, you know, life's not all, all what you see. But let's get it straight, right? Our kids aren't going to be sitting on the sofa at 35 drinking beers going, no, I'm not going to do anything, Dad, are they? <laughs> <laughs> but they're not, they're not going to be doing that. <laughs> but, then, but then again, who am I to, uh, if he or she is happy doing that, I'd be like, are you sure? Is this, is this really what you, you... You've seen everything and this is, this is what you want to do. Dad, I've seen it all. I've been here, yeah. I've been there, I've been with this person, but... You know what? This for me is 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 my happy place. Yeah. Then honestly, I would say, away you go, mate. Stay in your happy place. And the minute you want to change, or should anything ever change, then just so you know, I'll always be here, and that's it. That's all they need to know is that mum or dad or whoever looks after them is you know they'll always that one person. Yeah. Through through mistakes, through the, the highs and lows, like I say, um, to know that you've got that one person, I you know I feel is is the biggest. Every burden I ever will ever carry, I'll carry it with somebody else. You know, yeah. Um, you know, and that's that's a really reassuring, and quite a powerful thing to to have. And I know that everybody has that has that luxury, um, but if you can offer that, you know, albeit as a friend or a partner or whatever, it's a, it's a great thing to be able to offer and and, and stand yeah. by. What was your relationship with your dad like? Um, it was never mates. Um, my dad was a little bit old school in that sense. Um, he's not the type of dad. He's not a sporty dad to go out there and play football. Because I don't know whether he felt he'd lose, I'd lose respect for him if it became too pally. He still got to keep that. So um, I guess it's an old school way of, of parenting. Maybe I, I don't know. I agree with you. I think I think it's a generational thing. I think yeah. our generation now has experienced that, and because of that, I don't, I'm not going to speak for you, but for me. That has made me want to be helping with the homework. You want to be finding out how actually was your day at school? What what are you into? What are you not into? Yeah. And and feel those things. And if they've got an issue or if they love something, I want them to tell me. You know, I can't wait for the day. And I keep saying to my wife, you know, if my little daughter has a bit of an argument with somebody or, you know, it, it crushed me a little bit thinking that she's going to run to mummy and tell mummy her, her deepest secrets and all that. Because I'd love to... I want to be part of that. Yeah. Um, but then at the same time, because... Um, 
my relationship with my dad, we didn't have that, I guess. Um, then I, I'm kind of ready in case it doesn't happen as well. You know, I can kind of take it. Um, but, but you know, me and my dad had, a, had an amazing relationship. To this day, you know, is the probably the only, apart from my wife, is the only sp- person I speak to every single day. Wow, you, you speak to him on the phone every day? Every day, without fail, without Dude, fail. Dude, that's amazing. Um, yeah, I, I speak to my dad every day, and he's, he's, you know, in a weird way, we have become great mates. I took him on my stag do, you know, he's the first person I wanted there. <clears throat> he's very close to all my mates. And um, so maybe that was just his way of parenting. It sounds to me like in the earlier years, it was like, we aren't mates. Um, you're my son, I've got to teach you a few things, you're going to learn some things. Yeah. But then you got to an age where he's realised, right, now you're your own man. Totally. And now we can kind of be mates and now we're, yeah. now it's a different thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm extremely grateful um, to say that I'm, you know, really, really close to my dad. Yeah, it sounds like you've got a really, really beautiful relationship. I want to find out about your kids now. I want to know what they're into and what toys they like to play with. My kids are just not... Um, they're not that disciplined. <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll have 10 minutes at something and then they want the next thing, they're off, off to something else. We probably got about an hour's worth out of Barbie dolls a few weeks ago where we were dressing Barbie up. There you go. And um, putting different dresses on. Um, and it didn't quite last as long as I wanted it to because I was, I was in the element. I was absolutely loving it. You were into it. You were like, hold on, let me, we need to get a little outfit working. <laughs> yeah. We need to work this out. <laughs> And, and Marnie, after yeah, about 20 minutes or so, she was then on to, on to the next thing. She probably wanted to go colouring in or do something different. So Yeah, yeah. Um, conversation's a massive thing in our house. We encourage each other to tell stories and uh, ah, there you go. we'll make a little stage so they get up there and give their little story and you've got to listen. Most days I've got to tell my daughter how we, me and my mummy met, what our wedding was like. She's got an obsession with mummy and daddy meeting and falling in love and, and she really wants to hear that story time over and over and over again. Obviously, that's only with Marnie. She's four. Yeah, yeah. Little Milo is nearly two. He's not quite there yet, but uh, he's a cuddler. Oh. Um, people say this, that, you know, the girl's a little bit more independent. I don't know, you know, the boys, certainly for me, he's, he's fitting that mode at the minute. He's very sensitive. He wants to be held. He wants to be cuddled, kissed all the time. Whereas Marnie, um, I'll get a couple of kisses in and then it's, you know, that's enough, Daddy. That's, see you later, Daddy. Yeah. I've got stuff to do, Daddy. <laughs> yeah. I'm out. I, I'll, see you, I'll see you in a... In an hour or two, but I've got to take care of some stuff. Well, I love it, you know, I love getting brushed. I love getting brushed by a little four-year-old that she's like, Daddy, um, you know, that's that's enough now. And they're just perfect, two little perfect hybrids. Um, they're as happy playing in, in the muddy puddles as, as they are putting makeup on each other or, you know, there's there's no real... Yeah, I don't know who's the dominant one yet, who's the sensitive one. They just both kind of mimic each other the whole time, so... What about yourself? Did you have any favourite toys or things when you were a kid? Cars, I was obsessed with cars. So these little model cars, um, helicopters, planes, trains, motorbikes, and I'd just drive them everywhere and, you know, uh, on the carpet. <laughs> um, my nan and granddad were bakers and they used to get cardboard boxes for a lot of their, their deliveries and stuff. So they'd always keep the cardboard boxes and I'd, I'd cut them and felt tip them and I'd make car garages and park all my vehicles up there. And yeah. Yeah. So that was my thing. Cars were my absolute, die-cast models were, were my thing. Connecting with your kids is at the heart of what Dad Ventures is about, which is why we're so happy to have Connects as our sponsor. Connects and Kid Connects have projects for all the family and they're the perfect activity for kids and adults to connect naturally through play, imagination and creativity. Your wife Liz is also an actress, right? Yes. So does that make routine difficult with you guys and the kids? Yeah, I think that's something we're still figuring out as parents. Um, new parents, dare I say it, are we still new parents, I guess, with a four-year and two-year-old? Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. still give you that. You're still um, new. Yeah, that sense of routine is what we've lacked in our own lives. There's no real structure in the sense of, I don't know what I'm doing next week uh, or the month after that. You know, jobs can come in and, 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 you know, with that lack of routine, there is a worry because I think routine is, is key and vital, especially in a young person's life. Yeah. So without that, then there's always that worry. So obviously our only um, chance to, to implement a routine is obviously school time, breakfast time and, yeah. and bath time. We do things off the cuff quite a lot for us to whip off to the lakes one weekend uh, as we've done in the past. We wouldn't have planned for that and we just said, listen, should we go away tonight? And the kids, you know, get everyone ready and away we go. So yeah, I think routine is key and we just need to try and create a bit more of a structure for the kids, you know, not for ourselves, but certainly for the kids. It's something that I envy my friends who have got regular jobs you know they're home for the same time every single night yeah i envy that because 
um, no, for me, no two nights are the same. And, um, you know, it, it can be a little bit um, bit annoying sometimes and a bit frustrating. Do you think your children realise it? Is there anything in their behaviour that you say, oh, hold on, maybe that's because it's difficult for us to have the structure because of the way our lives yeah, are? Yeah, I think bedtime is, is a key example. Our bedtimes can can last anything up to... Run on to two, two like, yeah, hours. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and, and maybe that's a product of our um, unwillingness or... Uh, inability to create that proper structure. Yeah, but then there's also the other side where your child decides to talk to you about everything and anything <laughs> yeah, that yeah. they wanted to talk about. You've been asking them all day long yeah. about this, that and the other and then suddenly at bedtime, yeah. oh, daddy, can I tell you about this? And let me tell you about this. And this happened and blah, blah. And then yeah. suddenly you're an hour in. And it's weird, in those moments, um, you know, I want to experience that. So if it is 8.30... And we've been in bed for an hour and a half, you know, and suddenly we're talking and Manny says, can I, can you read me that one more story, Dad? And, I, and part of me is saying, Kelvin, this is it now. You need to wrap this up. You know, you need to be kind of cruel to be kind and say, no, it's bedtime and create that boundary and create that routine and that structure. Mm. Um, but, you know, 90% of Kelvin kind of says, this is beautiful moment and uh, go with it. Go with the flow, you know. So what about a routine? So what if we're up talking until 10 o'clock at night? Fast forward to the to the next morning, and, and the house is we're all late for school, and my, my <laughs> missus is there going, "Well, I did say." <laughs> so, like I say, I'm still learning. You know, I'm not the finished product just yet. So we've all done that, and then it all comes to fruition. Yeah, doesn't yeah. It? a bit later on. It sounds like if you see an opportunity and you see a door open where oh, I can get involved with my kids or we can explore something, you're up for it. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I'm always the kind of first to be silly. Even when we're walking through supermarkets, I guess, and the kids will see something and want to pick it up, uh, I'm, I'm not that parent who'll shout and scream, put that down, before they've even done anything. They're, they're experimenting, they're evolving, they're learning. True. And, um, and I let them do that. Now, I'm not saying that my kids are, you know, are really going out there and being inconsiderate. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, I've got to let my children explore. So they know that whatever they pick up, and they've got to put back, but they can definitely pick it up and explore it and, and investigate and see what it is. And if you find that you let your kids do that, then five seconds goes by and, you know, they put it back and, and that's fine. And I know this is always Different a situation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, but um, just let kids be free and let's jump in that puddle. You know, what's the worst that can happen? You're going to get, get muddy and wet. full of mud and you're going to get my car dirty. Well, yeah, so be it. Yeah, and I think it takes takes us back to what we mentioned earlier on about our parents... Uh, and the way we were parented, because that was very much the previous generation. It was like, no, don't touch, don't speak unless you're spoken to, that, you know, all of those kinds of things where you're kind of like stifling a little bit a child, aren't you? A little bit, in, in a way, you're stifling them. And it seems that you have, and, and I'm the same way too, you, you just let them go a little bit more, don't you? You let them yeah. feel things out a Have bit a more. little bit more freedom. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I guess maybe that could potentially come to bite me back. Because when I do then pull the reins in, they're like, I've given too much. And they're like, yeah, whatever, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, we'll be back in 20, yeah. Dad. Yeah, just let us work this out. You yeah, don't know yeah, anything yeah. about this, Dad. You, <laughs> you stay out of this. So, yeah, the, you know, it's just, I guess, the joys of, of parenthood. And, uh, yeah, like I said before, there's, there's no, in many ways, there's no right or wrong. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's what suits that particular family, that particular dynamic and, and that situation. Because I don't know what, what he or she has, has, has experienced that day, you know. So, yeah. Of course. You know, uh, you, that you've got to show empathy with that. And um, he or she might think me like, giving the, my kids a free reign, running down the aisle is is the wrong thing to do. So um, it's finding that balance, I guess, isn't it? It's a little bit of live and let live, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I hear that your kids have double beds. Yes, I mean... What is this about? It's just ridiculous. Before we had children, we had spare rooms. We put double beds in the spare rooms. That's what, you know, that was kind of what we did. And then suddenly we have kids and I was like, right, okay, get a cot, you know, get these little cute single beds and that's that's all they need, yeah. you know, they're, they're this big. And my wife was like, no, 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 keep keep the double beds. So I think Marnie had a double bed. And the way we used to get her to sleep was that one of us would, would lie, tell the story, and then she'd nod off and then we'd, we'd get out. And Liz's excuse was that, well, in a single bed, I'm not really going to be able to lie with her comfortably. You know, to be fair, that's a good point. I mean, and there's so many parents 
that have been like curled up on a like little yeah, yeah. little cot bed or something and then been like okay I've got a crick in the neck <laughs> the next day. so we ended up yeah and, and then now it's become like the norm now and um, they're used to sleeping in, in a double bed and uh, it's a, you walk in and you see my little 20 month old son and he's just sprawled out on this double bed and he's, <laughs> he's weirdly taking it all up you know, I'm actually looking at it thinking it probably it could probably do with a king. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> so my, this modern family, what are we doing? Mine have got double beds now, but that was only after secondary school because mine are okay. twelve and eleven, and right. after the secondary school because they used to sleep in the same room, and yeah, yeah. Um, it was a, a bunk bed situation, and it was like okay fine they need their own rooms now Rory's 12 Sienna's 11 you know we're going to go through body changes and all of that in the next couple of years we need separate bedrooms so we had to go into the loft and put them in separate bedrooms and the call was made I don't don't think it was me I don't know but basically it was like well do we get some singles now to maybe in six years seven years go okay you actually want a double bed or do we just buy the double bed now and then go we went with the double bed and they've got double beds now but at two, wow, that's a big old bed. Yeah, you know, you said bunk beds. Bunk beds have been mentioned quite a bit recently, and it's what mine and my daughter keeps asking for. Ooh. So we're about to we're about to move house, and, and we've kind of said that in, in our new house we'll get a bunk beds in the new bunk house. bed. Yeah, so maybe that could be the transition. Um, and bunk beds, let's face it, they're cool, aren't they? Do you know what I mean? They look cool, and as a kid, yeah. that's I. I was the same. I used to share a room with my little brother, um, and, and we had bunk beds. And being the older brother. I dominated the situation. I got the top bunk. I was, you know, I was the, <laughs> the king of the, of the house of the bedroom. So I, I can't wait to, um, I don't know whether, I mean, I'd love for them to share. Manny and Milo to go in the same same room, but I guess, you know, anticipating what you're probably going through now that, you know, with, with adolescence and the changes and, and they want in the, and yeah, their own space. If we're lucky enough at the minute we are, you know, to have those separate rooms, then, then absolutely we'll, you know, we'll do that and keep them in their own little quarters. Yeah, yeah. And hopefully, yeah, the doubles will become two little single bump beds. And that, that for me, would be great because Manny could be on the top, I could be on the bottom. And I'd just make a little den with her because I love making dens as well, you know. Dare I say, even on a school night, I'm just like, let's sleep on the sofa tonight, let's make a little den. That's cool. Um, so little, see, so you, you do like to do these little things that just make life a little bit more interesting a little bit more exciting a little bit a little bit harder a little bit harder for the morning <laughs> <laughs> do you think that stems from something in your childhood that's all the stuff that I weren't allowed to do right so maybe that's that's why I do it you know um, I've got an open house policy you know and um, I love nothing more than friends calling in dropping by yeah uh, obviously it's a little bit different now with COVID and that but you know um, when things are, are normal that's pretty much what I want and um I'd love now Manny started school to come back and bring all our friends back. But I want to make tea for them all. I want everyone to be playing and, and be there. And It's almost like a sense of community, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I love meeting a new little friends at school and, and being that. And, and I want to be that involving dad. And I guess I'll quickly become that embarrassing dad as well. But <laughs> so be it. You know, I, I am, I'm prepared to get dressed up and, and be silly. And, and I feel like when I spend time with kids, you forget everything, don't you? Yeah. You know, it's complete escapism. And um, it's just, yeah, it's magic. So my missus is the opposite. <laughs> She's like, no, no, you know, that's enough. Let's just keep it with us. Your friends are coming around all this. So we got, you've invited five of Manny's, Manny's friends to come around. The house is going to be a mess. Yeah, but is that because, is that because, right, you invite everyone around and you're down there playing with everyone and she's got to make sure everyone's <laughs> yeah, actually yeah. all right. She's the one who's got to worry about, okay, has, has yeah. Walter's name fallen over? Has somebody got something to sleep in? Has, has somebody yeah, Kel- eaten? Kelvin, no one's eaten for four hours. I'm like, <laughs> oh, they'll be fine. They'll be right. Come on, let's go and do this. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not very responsible. <laughs> it's the dad's way, definitely the dad's way. It just shows you're you're in it. You're fully in it. You're hands on, as hands on as you can kind of be. You know, one or two dads who are going through a different situation. That maybe they're going through a separation and they're struggling with getting access to their kids because of things that aren't their own fault. Is it difficult to see in their experience and their current situation? And I presume every every situation is, is maybe unique, but it feels like everything's against them. Statistically, most kids do probably stay with their mums and it's the dads who are, 
who have become that very much a part-time parent. Yeah. It feels like the stereotype is that dads don't want to be there and dads are not really involved as much as they should be. That's not in my experience, you know, and in my experience with my friends, it's the absolute opposite. The dads are so proactive, absolutely want to be in that child's life. And then suddenly when that's not being uh, listened to or being allowed. Yeah. I've seen the damaging impact that, that that can have, you know, on the adult first and foremost, heartbreaking for the for the father who's not able to see their baby. Yeah, of course. When I listen to one friend in particular, I listen to him talk, he's, he's two years into to court cases and, 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 you know, what was figured out in court, um, unfortunately, sometimes... Doesn't come to pass. The other party, yeah, doesn't, for whatever reason, says, you know, you're not seeing him um, today and uh, and there's nothing he can do. The next step is to go back to court and then financially it's another burden and yeah. and he's already thousands and thousands of pounds in. He's now left with that choice of, of what do I do? Do I keep spending money going down this route that is so one-sided against yeah. me as a dad? You know, how much further can I go? So I, I have absolute massive sympathy. Was there anything that your friend had done that would warrant them being in this situation? In his particular um, scenario, there isn't. It was just unfortunate that a, a relationship breakdown you know, where those two adults felt they were no longer compatible with one another and uh, and they went their separate ways. Now, in theory, you know, they should still be able to operate as parents, albeit, you know, apart from one another. And that's the process that's, that's been immediately halted. Um, they went through through the proper channels via courts yeah. because an agreement couldn't be found. It was quite clear there was still a lot of resentment uh, between the two. Coming from one side mainly, you know, my friend was quite mature in a sense that Although he was he was gutted that that relationship could no longer carry on, um, the next most important thing was to make sure that as a father he would be there for his child. So they couldn't accommodate both of their wishes uh, for custody, so they had to kind of go through the impartial Court. courts. Yeah, um, and, and and a deal was done, and, and custody was there. Everything was settled. The relevant persons heard, heard both stories, and, and a decision was made, and a decision that in court both people were happy with. And then, for whatever reason. Um, there's been a few instances after that that out of the blue, completely out of the blue, um, with no reasoning that that person has not abided by that court ruling and suddenly my friend then finds himself not being able to have seen his child for weeks. Wow. And there was nothing that they could do. They didn't know whether to, is it something I need to call the police? Should I? I don't want to bother police for something that's not really important. Yeah. And, and he was advised, it's not a police matter, that he should um, contact the courts. So he contacted the courts and then found out that I think there was something like a £400 fee every time you have to go back to the courts, you have to get representation. And and uh, he did this numerous times. And every time it got to the court, there was no real sense of repercussion other than just a uh, slap wrist for the other party, for her. Yeah. She felt that she had a justified reason because she came up with an excuse that the time didn't see it. Whatever it was, it was a it was a one-off and it won't happen again. But then it's happened again and again. And it's happened again numerous times. And every time it's just another, you know, something that, that the financial now he cannot support. So every time uh, the court order is not followed, he has to then be the catalyst that then takes that to court to go and argue his case. Uh, and it just feels like it's, it's, it's against him. It's against him. And, and all he's wanting to do is to be an active figure in his child's life and he's not being able to do that. So that's the, it's so frustrating for him. He can't compete now financially. And uh, he feels that he's having to go through this process with somebody who's emotionally still attached to him and feels the need to hurt him via you know, via the, the, the access. Yeah, now you said that there's no repercussions for this. I don't know, I mean, I don't know the way the system works, but I would think that if that was the other way around, if it was a father that wasn't adhering to the rules or, or pulling something out, maybe the first time you get away with it or the second time you get away with it, but if it's repeated, there would be more than a slap on the wrist. You know, the police's reluctance, and maybe rightly so, to get involved because it's a... Uh, you know, maybe a civil matter, it's uh, something for the courts to decide. Yeah, yeah. But on the other hand, I'm, I'm sure if it was the female ringing saying, I've, I'm here to pick up my, my son or my daughter and the father is not allowing me, yeah. I'm pretty confident that there'd be an abundance of public servers there to serve and to help. Uh, and again, maybe wrongly or rightly, but it feels does feel one-sided. There's no consistency between the two. Um, and, and that's where I feel it's unfair because in my experience, in my experience of my friends, the dads want to play an active role and understand the importance of a father figure in their child's life. And, uh, and when they're being proactive and they want to be that and they're not able to do that and it feels like it's just an uphill struggle and it's an unfair situation, it's an unfair ruling, yeah. it's an unfair with the courts, whoever it is, then one has to kind of question, 
it does get an equal rights here. You know, equality at the minute is the buzzword, and rightly so. Yeah. And is it being represented in the courts and through the channels of parenting for, for dads? Is there yeah. equal opportunities and equal rights for, yeah. for the dads out there? Well, it's something that we here at Dad Ventures are passionate about, you know, keeping an eye on and, and making sure that equality does does reign through at the end. But yeah, like you said, it is, it's, it is a bit of an uphill struggle at the moment, but we've got to keep fighting the fight, haven't we? Absolutely, yeah. You know, and... Uh, like I say, I always remember that, you know, a dad's role in, in a child's life is absolutely key yeah. and just as important as, as the mother's role. Dads now in 2020 are way more um, up for being involved and being with their kids. And they want to break that mould. They want to break that perception. And you kind of want a system to be able to say, let's work together and, and get this done. So hopefully they're going to figure something out. Yeah. But, um, you know, the, the main thing is, is what I always try and reassure them is if you don't get the opportunity to tell them face to face just document it your thoughts your concerns whatever it is yeah. if they're not of the understanding of the age where they are going to understand what's going on you don't want to complicate their little minds of what mummy or daddy might be doing or it's, it's irrelevant yeah. that emotional struggle that battle that bitterness that relationship breakdown is completely irrelevant the, the main focus is the children I think you make a good point that documenting and writing shows willing yeah. it shows that you want to be you, you haven't just given up it's an explanation, you know, and it's yeah. not an afterthought. It's not a, I did this several years ago because of this. And uh, when you read back years later, it's obvious what that person was thinking. It wasn't an afterthought. Mm. It's an active say, of, this is not quite how I want things. Just to let you know, whenever you see this, I want to make sure that, you know, my thoughts are, are yeah. put on there and, and documented. So, How important is it for us as dads to talk to each other and share and do what you and I are doing right now? Um, I think it's... Crucial, I guess. It's key. Just from our chat, I've got so much from it. Yeah, totally. You know, I don't know an awful lot about you, Nigel, as a person. I obviously know you professionally because you're in my living room, you know, a lot of the time <laughs> the week and my kids watch you. So there's, always, there's, there's, there's an instant um, familiarity with you. But yeah, as a dad, yeah. I relate to you. We're going through the We're same thing. We're going things. through the same thing. Exactly. exactly, yeah. And it's brilliant when you chat to other dads and you're like... You could take a lot from it. You know, it's, it's powerful and um, it's always good to talk, um, talk dad stuff, isn't it? You know, I love it. If you ever are uh, sitting about on a Friday night, we sit there with beers. I actually sit there with gin mostly in the second hour. What's this? Is this just a social thing you have? Or... Well, basically, I, I do it on Instagram on a Friday night. Oh, right, okay. It's a bit like... Remember, remember, like you used to have those radio shows, um, calling uh, midnight caller, yeah, 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 or whatever yeah. it is, back in the day. Caller, caller, I want to voice my, you know, or LBC or one of those. But yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. I do it on Instagram. Some people come with their partners. We've got single mothers that come. All sorts of people come. All oh, right, okay. Oh, cool. It's a good laugh. If you're ever about, you're welcome. All oh, right, okay. Yeah, I'll keep, I'll keep an eye out for it. Okay, I can officially say now that you are a dad Avengers role model dad. Okay. The thing wow. is, as dads, we're not perfect. I will be first to admit that. We come unstuck from time to time. And here at Dad Ventures, we call them dad fails. I'm gonna tell you one of mine quickly to, to, to sort of put you at ease a little bit. And then I'm gonna ask you to see if you remember one of yours. Okay. Rory, my firstborn, is, he must have been about two to three, two months, maybe not even. Yeah, young, really, really young. Yeah. And I was night feeds, man. I was Mr. Night Feeds. Uh, Melina would express and then I'd do the night feed so that she could have a proper night's sleep. That was the routine that we, we came up with. Wow. Um, he's in the Moses basket uh, next to the bed and he wakes up and it's, you know, it's feed time, middle of the night, two in the morning, three in the morning. Melina's half asleep. So I get up out the bed, you know, go over to the Moses basket, grab the handles. I think I've grabbed the handles. I've only grabbed one handle. Go to pick up the Moses basket. <laughs> Moses basket goes on its side. Oh. Rory rolls out and you hear a little bit of a thud <laughs> as his head glances against the wall. Oh. I scoop him up as he's falling. Cause you know, as a parent, as, you're, as a child's falling, you're scooping already. You, you've got that cat-like reflex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it still hit. We still heard the thud. And I'm out of the room, you know, panic, 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 close the door behind me. Yeah, yeah. Examine, examine. He was absolutely fine. The head <laughs> hitting the wall. Didn't do him anything. But it's one of those moments where you're like, whoa, hold on, dad fail. Yeah, that is a that is a pretty big dad fail, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you had, you've got every excuse in the book, though, because I guess it was dark, it's late. Yeah, you know, it was. Yeah, it was. Early it was. hours in the morning. You got, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's understandable. It's justified in some ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was still a moment. Mine was, recently I was filming, um, I was filming for the BBC, actually, abroad on a job. And um, the girl who played my wife in, in, in the show, yeah. um, she had the most amazing French plat. And uh, weirdly, things I've started noticing now, I look at hair on girls. Of course, because you've um, got to learn to French plat. 
because I've got to start well and I was looking at it and I said I think your hair's grass are, are they really complicated to do that because I figured out a normal plait but yeah. they look how would you where would you, where'd you even start with that I'd love to be able to you know give one my, to my daughter yeah and she's like, well, I'll teach you, Kelvin. I'll teach you. So we spend the next 20 minutes or so and, I, and I'm practising on it. And then I got home and I, I attempted it on the, on the school morning. And <laughs> <laughs> I, just the reaction in the playground was enough. Because I think the, the, my missus was running about that morning. It was one of those rush mornings and I'd kind of thought to myself the night before, I'm going to do it tomorrow morning. And in the morning, I think Liz is giving Milo uh, the, the breakfast and I'm I'm doing this with Marnie and she's keeping still and then she's seeing something and... And I'm like, you know what? Uh, yeah, I think I'm. I think I'm happy with that. And then dropping her off at school, uh, just the look from the other parents was enough to kind of say, "Whoa, you've had a shocker." And then it's that nod as well. You know that parent yeah. nod to, "Oh, look, he's had a he's had a go at it. He's had a go. Bless him. He's had a go." And I and I must have just at least he had a go. At least I must have just well matched done, that. You know that that, that stereotypical dad is. You know. We're a little bit rushed and mine is going in there and bless her, she's got this lopsided little French, half French plat and um, <laughs> and I came away feeling a little bit guilty. I was I walked out of the house with a real sense of pride that I'd achieved it and yeah, it looks all right, it looks pretty good, that. And then just the reaction and the double takes was enough for me to think, oh, 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 maybe, maybe I won't do that one again. Uh, I think it's not that you don't do it again, you practice a little bit more. No, practice a little bit more. Yeah. And then you'll get it when it's right. Nice, dude. Nice. Just before we finish, I like to ask our dad vengers this question: If you could have a dad superpower, what would it be? Mm, good question. Um, yeah, I think for me, a superpower would be to be a kid again, to have moments of, of, of to maybe to relive, you know, those sort of moments. So, yeah, you know, I guess there'll become a time now in the next maybe few months when I'm I've got. Marnie on off the stabilizers. Hopefully, I want to try and get a get a ride in a little bike, and um, I'd love to be able to just relive that moment for me for five minutes, just to the you know relive it again. Of that achievement, when, just the yeah, feeling. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I guess that would be uh, that would be my superpower. You've also given me a really good thought about imagine we were kids with our kids. Imagine we could go back for like a weekend and be their, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Be their mate. Do their mate. At, at, yeah, yeah, yeah. at their age. <laughs> wow, that would be amazing. Kelvin, thank you so much for talking to us. Um, it's been a pleasure and a joy. Keep on parenting the way you are because I'm loving it. And hopefully I'll see you very, very soon. Yes, no, absolutely. And Nigel, I really enjoyed it. So keep doing what you're doing. Keep up the dad vengers and uh, yeah, it's a great, great platform, mate. And uh, may we see it continue. Oh, thank you very much. Listen, mate, take it easy. Take care, man. Be good. Bye bye. Now there's a hands-on dad. He wants to play more with toys than his kids do, and he's brave enough to even put a French plait in his daughter's hair. How it looked isn't the point. He attempted it, and I hope he attempts it again soon. I'll certainly want to see a picture when he does. As for his friend's court battle, there can't be anything worse for a loving dad than not being able to see their child. And I sincerely hope he finds a solution soon. Thanks for listening. This has been the Dad Vengers podcast, sponsored by Connects, encouraging kids of all ages to think outside the blocks.